Life is complicated, unpredictable, and always changing. What always worked yesterday doesn't always work tomorrow. What you thought you had figured out doesn't always work out. Or just when you thought you had all the answers dialed in, you suddenly realized in a moment of failure, you don't have a clue. No matter who you are or where you live, one thing remains the same. Life happens. And when it does, it rarely sends an email letting you know. Work, money, relationships, parenting, marriage, adversity, career path, future plans, your life and your legacy are directly connected to the decisions you make in response to life's challenges and opportunities. Which is why, more than anything, you need wisdom. Wisdom you don't always have, but thankfully, because of God's Word and His Holy Spirit, wisdom you can get. Welcome to our series where five preachers tackle 10 topics with one goal, to help you get wisdom. Continuing our series uh, in fear, and just want you to know, in case you weren't terrified already, that there is more to fear. There's more to fear. Josh did a series on money, and Kent did a series on priorities. I'm doing a series on fear, and Kyle is going to be doing a series on hope. There's several... Um, have you have mentioned, has it, was it helpful, my sermon on fear? I, it was three weeks ago, so if you don't remember, that's totally fine. But it was helpful for me. Uh, one of, I was talking to one of you, and, and you said uh, it was one of the most helpful sermons I've heard on fear, not ever. Uh, <laughs> but, but I was just saying, you know, I, I, I only preach on things that I'm currently wrestling with myself. And one of the things I can't stand is inauthenticity. Uh, faking it is exhausting, isn't it? And Christians are really good at faking it. We look really good. We show up. You know, we got a smile on our face, but like, man, I'm barely making it. Like, I'm showing up, but pff, there's times where I'd rather run away at times. But I've always wanted some of the best advice I ever got from an old, older preacher. He said, Don't preach to where people pretend to be. Cut past all that, dig underneath, and preach to where people really are. And I, as a pastor, deal with a lot of fear. And you deal with a lot of fear. So I want to talk about fear and want to be honest about fear and open about fear. Is that all right with you? Everyone, whether you admit it or not, deal with some kind of fear in your life. And I'm not talking about phobias uh, like sharks um, (laughs) or pentherophobia, which is the Fear of your mother-in-law, <laughs> which that might actually be legitimate fear. I don't know your mother-in-law. But I'm talking about real fear, a sustained fear, kind of fear that puts a knot in your stomach and keeps you awake at night. Have you ever lied awake at night worrying about your fears, worried about your finances, worried about your kids, worried about your marriage, worried about your job. Those are the kind of fears that, that I want to talk about, and those are the kind of fears that we want to address because we want to be real. We want to hold those things up to the light and truth of God's Word and see what God's Word has to say. Because some of you are locked right now in the prison of fear, and God wants to come and hand you the key. You can let yourself out any time and start walking in obedience. Because God has already provided the salvation. He's provided the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to free you from sin so that you can start living a life that's blessed, living a life that's full of joy, not not free of fear, right? We're not called to be fear-free, but we're called to be faith-filled, full of faith in the hope of what Christ is going to do, in the hope of what he has said and clinging to his promises, The good news is not only does God want you to live your life in confidence, but he has actually provided a way for you to do that. We fear a lot of things. We fear that we might not have enough money. We fear maybe I'll always be single. We fear that maybe someone will never love me. We fear that maybe my marriage won't be my marriage may be stuck like this forever. We fear that maybe my husband will never leave, lead. We fear that, uh... <laughs> did you catch that? 
<laughs> Depends on who you're married to. But we fear our marriage might never change. We fear that the current circumstances that we're in, which are bad, might always be that way. We fear that we might not be able to have kids. We fear that if we do have kids, maybe we might mess them up, or we fear I might pass on the dysfunction to my kids that were passed on to me by my parents. We fear maybe something might happen to our kids. We see other people, the things that happen to their kids, they're hurt physically or spiritually, or maybe they walked off of uh, the path of following Jesus, and we think, is that going to happen to my kids? And we see some, some people's health failing. We think, is that, is that going to be my future? Is that what my future holds? Is that what I have to look forward to? Maybe we see other people in our career fields, and their marriage went south, or they lost their job, and we think, am I going to lose my job? We fear that we might end up dying alone. We fear we might not have enough for, for retirement. We fear that we might not be able to make the payment this month on the house. We there's tons of things to fear. There's fear on the inside. Voices that we hear speaking fear and speaking lies to us. And there's, there's fear on the outside. In a recent article in Times Magazine, it listed out some of the top ten things that Americans are most fr- afraid of. And we're afraid of biochemical warfare. We're afraid of government surveillance. We're afraid of... Of, uh, of terrorism, we're afraid of cyber terrorism, we're afraid of the econ- economic collapse, we're afraid of identity theft or credit card fraud or running out of money at the end of life. Fear invades our life. So fear, fear is always going to be present in the life of the believer or the non-believer. Even if you're a Christian, fear is always going to be present. So I'm not telling you to never be afraid. When God shows up to his people, he, he announces first to them, don't be afraid. But what I want to share with you today is some, way, some ways to face fear with great faith and to continue moving forward. Now, um, we're just going to try this. And I don't know if this will work. I don't think this has been done in the history of Grace City Church. But I am just going to swipe left on my phone, and I'm just going to read through the news. And let's see if the news does not fail to disappoint in spewing fear into the world. Are you ready? Are you nervous? I'm nervous. I know Pastor Josh is nervous. Okay, Jesus helped us to work. Okay. Here we go. North Korea on standby to launch. It's right there. I'm not lying. Oh, here's another one. The top five things that you're currently eating that will kill you. <laughs> I'm dead serious. See if the food you're eating won't kill you, Kim Jong-un will. He's going to nuke you. Ladies, the face you're... The products you're putting on your face isn't natural. It's peeling your face off. It's not natural. You need to get something else. Fear. 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 We're riddled with fear. I just have in my my notes my demon story. You want to hear my demon story? Time when I was really afraid. Uh, this, This was like five years ago. And I don't I remember all the details, but a friend and I, we had just gotten out of our seminary degree, and you know, so we knew all about the Bible, and we knew all about life, and, and, uh, and we, were, we were talking, we were having a conversation about spiritual warfare and demons, and um, we, weren't, we, weren't, we weren't debating whether demons were actually real. We believe that demons are real and at work in spiritual warfare, but we were just kind of wondering, like, what is really... The work of demons in the life of the believer and, and all that. So, uh, a few days later, actually a few nights later, uh, I was driving home 
and at the time we lived in Leavenworth, so I was driving home from Wenatchee, and I had to stop by my dad's office, which was in Kashmir. It was a warehouse. It's a warehouse, kind of the look of where they hide all the dead bodies. <laughs> and so the setting is a warehouse by a train tracks, 10 o'clock at night, full moon. You know where this is going? You know what kind of stories start off like that? What kind of movies start off like that? Usually there's chainsaws involved. So I stop in, and uh, you, I open up the door, and at the entrance of the office, you have to go up a flight of stairs. It's like 25 stairs up to the top. And at the top of those stairs is an iron gate. And so you, so you, know, you walk up there, chung, 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 you know, and the moon is reflecting off the iron gate. And, and there's a padlock on there that you have to unlock. And, and so, like, when you rattle it, it's an empty, hollow room beyond that, and you just kind of go, chung, 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 you know. You know, so it's like, so I unlocked it, and I just swing the gate open, you know, and it never does that during the daytime. <laughs> so I walk in, in the, to, the, to the open room, and I'm, it's a big room, and then, and then, and there's, and there's no lights. Oh, this is the dumb thing. The lights were in the very back of the room, and so you had to go through the whole warehouse to finally get to where you could actually turn on the lights, Okay. Keep in mind, I just had a conversation with my friend about the reality of demons in, in, in life. So I'm walking through, and I, I, I go through the hallways, and the rooms kind of get smaller. And I'm walking through, and I get my stuff, and I turn around, and I'm going to leave, and music starts playing in one of the offices. And this isn't like classical music. It's like Led Zeppelin like grunge rock, like, I am dead serious. So I'm like, okay, confidence, confidence. Like, I'm not a big guy. But like, I just, I turn into fight mode now. Like, I am not fighting, I, I'm fighting. And the first thing you do is when you get scared, you don't run, right? Because if you start running, whatever is, Whatever thing is over there is going to start chasing you. And then I have to go to the iron gate and try to get the iron gate undone and then run down a flight. So I'm like, I'm just going to face this. So I stuck out my chest, <laughs> my very small chest. <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just, I'm just going to own it. I'm going to, own it. I'm going to walk in there. I'm going to confront this thing in the name of Jesus. Tell whatever's in there to go back to hell. And see what, so I walk in. To the room, everything, all the lights are off. All the lights are off. Grunge music, right? <laughs> music going on. Are you scared? <laughs> I walk in, and the computer, it, I, I see that the speakers that the music's coming from, it's fairly loud. It's hooked to this computer, and the, compu the screen is, is off. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, hit the mouse and wake up the screen and turn this off. I touch the mouse, and I kid you not, the computer is turned off. <laughs> well, we believe in demons here at Grace City Church, just so you know. Okay? <laughs> Let's read some scripture. Okay. <clears throat> there, there's things that we're, we're fearful of, voices in our heads, of things in life, of situations in life. There's there's things that we're fearful of that are um, they're true. There's, they are things that we should be fearful of. There's, there's things that we're fearful of that we, we shouldn't have no fear of. A lot of our fear comes from the potential of something that might happen or might not happen. But here's the, uh, the verse that, from the Proverbs that we're basing our, our study off of. It says, My son... Do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight, but preserve sound judgment and discretion. And when you lie down, you will not be afraid. And when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have you ever lost some sleep lying awake, fearing what will happen to your kids, to you, your finances? Anybody lost some sleep due to fear? Studies are showing us that the new thing Americans are facing and the danger that they're facing isn't so much uh, 
heart conditions or blood pressure, but it's lack of sleep. Lack of sleep. Because of what we're fearing. What we're fearing might happen. Most of our fears are rooted in something that might never even happen to us, ever. But he says, do not fear sudden disaster, for Yahweh, the Lord, will be your confidence. The fact of the matter is, is that fear will always be present. So I'm not telling you here, you know, don't be afraid. Uh, you don't, don't ever fear, because fear will always be present. But here's how we deal with fear. Christians deal with fear differently, mainly because we have a different perspective on our fear. Now, I want to go through uh, some consequences of what fear will bring. So last time I was with you, I, we talked about um, questions to ask yourself, like the what-if scenarios, you know. What if this happens? What if that happens? And I gave you some steps to play those out. Go to the very bottom of your what-if, and then acknowledge that that would be the worst day of your life. That would be maybe the darkest day of your life. But you'll find out that at the very bottom of your greatest what-if, you'll find that there is a God who's beneath it all, who will bring you up and he will walk with you, and he will be the mender of broken hearts, and he will heal you, and he will restore you, and he'll put you back together, and he'll walk with you through that fear, and he will carry you to the other side to where you need to go and to where he wants you to be. That's what we talked about last time. So this time we're going to talk about some, because there's, there's kind of the flip side. There's, there's going into looking at your fear and seeing that God is there. But also, there's also consequences of giving in to fear. Have you ever thought about that? Sometimes we think of fear of like, well, there's the fear of stepping out into what God has called us to do and what might happen. But then there's also the fear, should be the fear of not obeying what God's called you to do. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at some consequences of fear. So here's what fear will do. Fear will obscure your view of God and of, your, and of yourself. If you're looking for something to write down, write this down. You will only get as close to God as your concept of him will allow. You will only get as close to God as your concept of him will allow. So if you have a view of God, if he's harsh, and he's distant, and he's mean, he's judgmental, he's vindictive, if that's your view of God, in times of fear, you will not run to that kind of, of dad. When my kids are afraid, I want them to run to me because I can be the source of help for their fear. What the enemy wants you to do is the enemy wants to obscure your view of God so that you'll run to something else, so that you'll run to money, so that you'll run to your spouse, so that you'll, you'll helicopter your kids, so that you'll, you'll run to your job or run to your work for security, and you won't run to the very source that can bring you out of your fear. Fear will try to persuade the, you that what you've done is too sinful or it's too dirty, that God can't forgive that. Fear will try to tell you that your sins have stacked up so high that God is not going to forgive that. That's a false view of who God is. That's a false view of his grace. That's a false view of his mercy for you. There is no sin that God can't forgive. There is no place that you've stuck yourself that God cannot pull you out of. See, fear will try to get you to believe that God's an abusive father that likes to hit his kids when they mess up. That's a false view of God. Rather than a loving father who gently instructs his children when they need discipline, who lovingly restores them when they bring him out. You see, if you're fearful of God because you think he's distant, that will obscure your view of yourself. If you're fearful of God because you think he's distant, guess what, the, guess what you're going to be in your relationships? You're going to be distant. If, if you're fearful of God because you think he's harsh, guess what you're going to be like to your spouse? Guess what you're going to be like to your wife? Guess what you're going to be like to your husband? Guess what you're going to be like to your kids? You're going to be harsh. If you're fearful of God because you think he's unforgiving, guess what you're going to be like towards other people? You're going to be unforgiving. If you're fearful of God because you think he's judgmental, guess what you're going to be like? to other people, to your relationships. 
It's self-destruction. You should, be, you, sh- you, should, you should be afraid of giving in to fear. Because giving in to fear will distort your view of God and it will distort your view of, of self. Here's another consequence of fear. Fear will keep you from obeying God. The enemy doesn't want you to live in freedom. He wants to keep you from experiencing the salvation and the freedom that God has granted you in Christ. He wants to keep you from walking in obedience. Now, fear isn't an indication that you don't have faith. If God has called you to do something and you're trying to act in obedience, fear is not an indication that you're not going to do something great for God. But rather, fear is an indication that the enemy sees that because you are trying to act in obedience, he's dispatched something in your heart. And he's wanting you to keep you from going where God has called you to go, and he wants to keep you from being who God's called you to be. Here's the other thing. If the enemy knows that you get free, you'll be a testimony to your kids that God sets people free. The enemy knows if you walk in obedience to God, you'll be a testimony to your spouse that God sets people free. If you walk in obedience to God, the enemy wants to keep you from walking in obedience to God because if you do, you'll be a testimony to the people around you that God sets people free because the enemy doesn't want you to be a light to other people. He wants to keep you from walking in obedience because he knows walking in obedience will bring blessing, will bring joy, will bring freedom, and will bring release And he knows that you will be a witness to other people who are trapped in the prison of freedom. And he does not want that. You need to to get upset that the enemy doesn't want that. You need to to say, no, I'm going to walk in obedience. And when I walk in obedience, I'm going to experience the the blessing of God. And I'm going to get set free. And I'm going to show others how to walk in the freedom of Christ. Amen? Fear has kept some of you in the room from being public with your faith. Fear's kept some of you in the room from offering forgiveness to someone who's hurt you. Fear will try to get you to bail on a marriage that God is just about to restore. Our society will tell you that it takes courage to get out of a relationship. Yeah, you know, that old bag, that old windbag, you should just leave her. Oh, that's courageous. I think it actually takes more courage to stay in a marriage and love a person who's not loving you back very well. Now, I, know, I know there's a lot, a lot of different scenarios, and I don't, I don't mean to just say that over every single scenario in here, but I'm talking about a marriage situation where a spouse just isn't feeling the love that they used to feel. Just don't, 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 feel, don't feel as respected as I used to f- feel from her. Don't feel as loved from him as I used to feel loved from him. The enemy wants you to get, get you to bail on your marriage. And you might be tapping out at the moment that God is about to do a miracle in your marriage and in your heart and in your spouse's heart or in your kids. Here's another thing. Fear will try to cause you to lose hope when God is about to make a way. Now, when you're trying to obey God and walk in obedience, I don't have to feel faith in order to have faith. Faith isn't, faith isn't an outcome, but faith is an outlook. Okay? So, there might be times that I might have faith and I'm trying to walk in obedience, and my marriage is still stuck. There might be times I might have faith, and I'm trying to walk in obedience, and I'm still single. There might be times I'm trying to walk in obedience, and I have faith, but I'm still sick. There might be times I'm trying to have faith and walk in obedience, and I have faith, but the finances still aren't coming in. Here's the thing. I'm not held hostage by the outcome. 
of what I think it should be. Because my faith isn't in an outcome that I perceive to be good. My faith is in the God who has provided for me. My faith comes not from my circumstances and what's happening to me. My faith comes from in the solid rock of Christ Jesus and what he's provided for me. So I can move forward in obedience even when my marriage is difficult. Maybe it won't get better, but God's going to give me courage and hope and faith and love so I can love that person in the loveliness. I might move forward in obedience even when, I know, when my teenager rolls their eyes at me because my faith isn't in them coming back to me or not. My faith is in God who can change them. Amen? Your faith needs to be in the bedrock of Christ, not your situation. Here's the next thing. Fear, no consequence of fear. Fear will cause you to doubt the promises of God in your life. Now, I'm just going to take one example of a promise of God in your life, and we're going to take an example from an Old Testament narrative. One promise that God has for your life is that you are never alone. You're never alone. Let me give you the context of the story that we're going into. Elisha was one of the greatest prophets in Israel. He, He performed the most amount of miracles in the Old Testament. And he was in the city of God and his servant. And the Arameans were coming down uh, and had surrounded the city. And they had no idea what they were going to do. So that's where we pick up in the story. So it says, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Have you ever woken up and felt surrounded? Surrounded by criticism? Surrounded by fear and surrounded by doubt? Have you ever turned on the news and felt surrounded by bad news? Have you ever felt surrounded in election season? Or wacko people on both sides or being such idiots that like you want to go in your backyard and you want, you want to bury your stuff and not just your stuff, but hide your kids and hide your wife. And just live there. You felt surrounded. You wake up and you feel surrounded. Here's what the servant prays. He says, Oh no, my Lord. Have you had any oh no, my Lord moments this week? That's not a bad prayer to pray. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? Servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And this is where the servant, he's looking out. See, he's looking out, and all the servant sees is the Arameans. He's looking out here and he's, he's saying, you know, Elisha, uh, I don't know what public school you went to, <laughs> but there's more of them out there than there are here. I just see two of us and I see thousands of them. I was wondering whether Elisha prayed that prayer out loud or not, and here's why. If the servant couldn't see, here's what, here's what Elisha said, prayed. He said, open up his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked down, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire. I was wondering whether or not Elisha prayed that prayer out loud or not, and here's the reason why. If Elisha... If, if all the servants could see was the army sur- surrounding them, the Arameans, and he, saw, and he heard Elisha pray, he might have thought that because Elisha prayed, then God sent deliverance. What actually happened is Elisha prayed and the servant got a new perspective. That he wasn't surrounded anymore by an enemy but that the armies of the living God had surrounded his enemies. You want to write something down, write this down. You don't need greater protection. 
you need greater perspective. Because the climax of the story, the point of the story, isn't when, that, that the people of God pray and then God sends deliverance. The climax of the story is that the people of God pray and our eyes are open to see the deliverance that God has already provided. Here's the thing. Did, did you see this? He says, open up his eyes, Lord. Wait a second. The servant already got up this morning. He already opened up his eyes. He needed to have his eyes, he needed his spiritual eyes to open up. Did you need, no, you need to wake up twice every morning. You need to wake up your, your physical eyes, then you need to wake up your spiritual eyes to catch the perspective of what God is doing. Because you think you're surrounded by your enemies. The fact is, your enemies are surrounded by God. Even in the midst of it. So here's what happens. You, Paul says in Ephesians 2, I pray that the, the eyes of your heart spiritual eyes will be open so that you can see the salvation of the Lord. Here's what happens. You need a greater perspective on your fear than just your physical eyes because all you can see is that you're surrounded. But what God does is God takes you back. He, op- he opens up your eyes and then you go back into the same battle but with a different perspective. You go into the same battle knowing that he's already provided for you. So here's the thing. You don't pray for the salvation of God. You pray that he'd open your eyes to the salvation that he's already provided for you in Jesus Christ. You don't pray that he would, he would take away your fear. You pray that he would open your eyes to see that you, he's already surrounded your fear. There isn't anywhere you can go that is outside of the protection of Christ. You, what you need to fear is that you would be outside of the protection of the one who commands the wind and the waves. You, you fear being outside of the protection of the one who's surrounded your enemies. God doesn't take you out of your fearful situation. He puts you back into it with a different perspective. And he says, now obey me. Now walk in obedience. Now stand and see the deliverance of the Lord. Amen? You can clap at that point if you want to. <laughs> the breakthrough moment of your faith. Your fear doesn't go away when you pray and then, and then see that God shows up necessarily. The breakthrough moment of your life is when you pray and understand that God has already provided for you. That way you can go back into your marriage that isn't working, and you can see that God has already surrounded your marriage. You can go back in, you can look at your teenager who you're not on speaking terms with, and you can go back into that same battle with the perspective that God has already surrounded you, and he's protecting you, and he's for you, and he's fighting for you. You can go back to your job. You can look at the economy and think that it's collapsing, but I'm going to go back into it with new eyes and a new perspective. And I'm going to say, I'm going to see the deliverance of the Lord. And you need to pray, Lord, open up my eyes. That's why we sing, open up our eyes. Surround us with your light. Because we need new spiritual eyes to see the deliverance of the Lord that he has already provided in Christ Jesus. Amen? I need to continue on because I am the only pastor that finishes on time. So we need to keep going. (laughs) God wants to tell you today, don't give up in your situation, but to press on knowing that you'll receive the promises of God. Here's some things that you can do for for your faith. Just so you know, you don't have to fear. Faith isn't, faith in God isn't the absence of fear. Faith in God is the presence of Christ bigger than any fear you face. Here's some things that I want you to do. You need to feed your faith. People, write this down. We receive God's power by consuming God's promises through his word and through community. The reason we get so dominated by fear isn't because we don't have any faith. It's because you're not feeding the faith you have. So many people are like, Lord, take this fear away from me. Take this situation out of me. It's like, The Lord's like, if I took the fear away from you, you wouldn't need me. But I've provided faith for you. So start feeding your faith until your faith is bigger than your fear and give fear the eviction notice that it can't be here any longer. And send it outdoors. Arm yourself with the word of God. When you wake up in the morning and you're surrounded, do you have promises of God that you rehearse to yourself? Do you? Or, or the first thing you do is you look at the news and you see that Kim Jong-un is going to nuke you. Or you see that, that your teenager is rebelling against you, rolling their eyes again. Or you see that there's not enough funds in, 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 in the bank. Or you see that your job might be ending. 
Do you see that? Are you, are you rehearsing the promises of God in your life through his word? Studying his word, knowing his word. You need to remind your enemy that you're more than a conqueror. You need to remind your enemy that not for every situation, but in all situations, I'm going to give thanks. Because God's not left me. I'm not alone. And guess what, enemy? You're surrounded. God has given us his word in every accessible way. And you wonder why your courage is malnourished? Or, excuse me, you, you wonder why you don't have any courage? It's because your courage is malnourished. Another way we do it is through community. If you want to feed your faith, let's be honest, you need to show up here more than once a month. Now, if this is getting too personal, just say amen, just clap, just be like, yeah, amen, that's right, you need to be here more than once a month, no one will know. But seriously, if you show up here a third of the year, a fourth of the year, you're going to be malnourished. Because God has things he wants to say. He has perspective he wants to give to you. He has a focus that he wants to change. And that happens through worship. It happens through other people. So you come in here and you realize, oh, I thought I was the only one living for God. I thought I was the only one trying to raise a godly family. I thought I was the only one whose marriage was struggling. I thought I was the only one whose kids were rebelling. I thought I was the only single parent who was trying to make this work. There's other people. And they're worshiping God and they set their focus on God. That happens in community. That happens when you get together and you lift high the name of Jesus, not your fears. Perspective changes when you're around people of God. And I know this is basic, right? It's the basics. Read your Bible, be in community. I was watching, a, uh, I was watching an interview with Tom Brady and uh, I know there's lots of mixed, mixed feelings with Tom Brady. I know there are. Uh, there's conversations about him being the goat, you know, and he was asked if he was the goat. Now, to be honest, I didn't know what the goat was. Uh, my only reference point was the Chelan Billy Goats, and I don't think they're very intimidating. So I was like, the goat, big deal. Ooh, hey, goats. Frog goats. Okay. Um, <laughs> And, and so, so he was asked. He, he was asked if uh, if he likes being the if he should be the next goat. And uh, so, what I found out was it's an acronym, right? Greatest of all time, goat. That's what it is. Oh, well, I wasn't the only one. Okay, you're like, oh, okay, all right, greatest of all time. And uh, what what reminded me of the analogy is that even Bill Belichick has said that Tom Brady wasn't that great of an athlete when he found him, but he did the basics well, right? So, so they asked him, hey, Tom, what made you such a great football player? And, and, and he goes, well, that's not the voice he has, but that's the voice I'll use for him. He goes, well. He goes, I laughed when he said it. He goes, I played a lot of football. And when you do the basics a lot, you do things well. You know, you ask any confident person walking around who's in the midst of great fear, how are you so confident? Well, I read my Bible every day. Hey, how come you have so much peace? I've forgiven a lot of people. Hey, how, how come, I mean, I know things are falling apart in your life. How, how, come, you, how come you just, you seem so confident and you seem like you have, you have, you have so much uh, uh, peace and, and joy? Well, my gospel community is praying for me. Hey, man, man you, you're just, you're just, life just seems to be going amok in your life and, and so much pain and sorrow. And yet, yet what, are you, what, what are you doing? You, you, seem, you seem fine. Well, I pray a lot. I memorize a lot of scripture. It goes back to the basics, right? Doing the basic things well will make you strong and confident in your faith. And you'll see that the enemy hasn't, surround, hasn't gotten you surrounded. You'll see that God has got your enemy surrounded. Now, I want to invite the band out, and I want to invite you to stand. 
There's a... Uh, There's a really cool psalm in Psalm 17. And in Psalm 17, uh, David was a man who was surrounded by great fear. David was often by himself, and he had his band of men, but he was often on his own. And he was being pursued by people. His enemies had had him surrounded. And there is a beautiful verse in Psalm 17. He says, David, I will keep you as the apple of my eye. Now, that's, that's how in English we render the, uh, the figure of speech. Here's what the Hebrew actually says. The Lord says to David, I will keep you as the small man of my eye. Now, if you were to look at a person... And you were, it's about, at about seven inches away, I was going to have you do this to your neighbor, but I think it'd be too awkward. <laughs> but go home and do this in the mirror. But when you get, it's about, when you get about eight inches away, all of a sudden you'll start seeing your reflection in the pupil of the other person. And God says, I'm going to hold you as the small man in my eye. What does that mean about your father? It means he's got you, it means he's near it means he's close. It means he's here. Here's the truth. You behold what you become. If you behold the face of fear, your literal countenance will begin to change. You will walk around through life reflecting the fear that you possess. But if you hold the face of your Heavenly Father, you cannot look at your Heavenly Father and yet start to look like Him. And your countenance will completely change. You will be confident. And you're going to be able to walk forward in obedience to Him, knowing that whatever the outcome, my faith stands in the bedrock of Jesus Christ. You continually behold your Father and you'll begin to look more and more like Him. See, I came in today. This is why we worship. Because when we worship, we realize all the fear that's surrounding us is being surrounded by our Heavenly Father because it gives us another perspective. Here's the truth. I came in today, I came in today hearing voices of my enemy shouting loud at me. But in worship, I hear a voice. And it's the voice of my Heavenly Father speaking to my storm, speaking to my fear. He says, you back off, devil. You back off, Satan, because that's my child. That's my daughter. That's my son. You back off. And then we turn to him and we worship him. That's why we raise our hands. Because we raise our hands as fearful children to a faithful father. Knowing that he has guaranteed a righteous outcome. Amen? So we're going to sing. We're going to sing Christ the Lord, Cornerstone. He alone is our rock through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Let's lift our voice to Him.